So hello everybody, my name is Owen Kennedy. Uh, topic for today is weaving technology into rural fabric. Basically, I'm the warm-up act for the amazing Joe Mulvihill who comes after me, but this is a particular interest area of mine, and I'll explain why in a few minutes. The sad news is that I don't have all the answers, but, and this presentation from what I originally proposed ended up being slightly different after a series of interviews that I did with people. So who has, let's see who has kids in the audience. Does anyone know who this is? I don't recognize that character. Oh. Okay, this is Bing, Bing Bong from Inside Out, and basically, it, imagine a character made up of bits and pieces, and that kind of best describes me. So, you know, I spent a long time in PR, I was an ex-teacher, did a lot of training, uh, did some stints in marketing, lecturing, digital media, and on conferences. But the one that's relevant for today is about six years ago, I packed up uh, and left Dublin. I moved from concrete jungle in Dublin to a very rural village in the west of Ireland, and actually about two miles outside a rural village, to start a tech, fa to found two tech startups. So, this whole area of technology and how it's integrated into rural society is of great interest to me. So, this is um, this replicated uh, throughout Ireland and throughout towns in Ireland, villages in Ireland, and I'm sure across kind of Europe and lots of places. And then um, this was a shop run by Miss Welch, and I used to go in, I'd buy the Irish Times. I uh, would occasionally look around in awe at these farm implements that I had no idea what they did, to be out-of-date chocolates. And on one side, there was a massive stack of um, wool that nobody ever seemed to buy, and I always kind of marvelled at it. She got sick one day, and the shop almost instantly closed, because nobody had the appetite to run an economical venture as this one was. But there was a certain amount of sadness of what was lost. So, you know, this was the imperfections of it, the, you know, the conversations that took place around it, the 40-year repository of knowledge that she had of people, and that kind of continuity of, of things that used to happen. The economics of it didn't make sense, but it just vanished overnight. And this rush to urbanization is not unique for um, Ballon Road, where this was kind of, where this kind of took place. It's kind of happening throughout Ireland, where you see shops kind of closing. Sometimes it's um, economic based because there isn't the work in, in in a lot of these rural communities, and sometimes it's structure. So this obsession with antisocial behaviour has made a lot of our villages and towns antisocial. So you know this lack of public space, lack of place where people can sit down and have proper conversations, has made them totally. Um, antisocial. And this decay kind of represents itself in you don't see young people. Like young people just aren't kind of visible around, around these kind of places. You know, the expansion of the drug empires from outside the cities into the towns and villages has had a huge kind of impact. The zombie estates that are quite common, um, the one house uh, or commuter belt kind of ribbon developments, all of these have been chipping slowly away of kind of what rural communities are. And most of it is irreversible. A lot of structural things are irreversible and they won't kind of change. But like what's special about rural living in the first place? When you, when you look for definitions of what rural living means, it's either, uh, it's either derogatory, in that it's backward, or it's spatially orientated, that it's low density living, that you, know, you don't have people in high rise kind of living environments. But it's probably more than that, and this is kind of what happens to rural Ireland. Um, this is going to be the future for a lot of rural Ireland. There's a photograph I took, it's a bit vague there, but this photograph I took during Heritage Week, and it's a pre-famine village in the city of Galway. So it's literally in the, the confines of the city of Galway that they completely forgot about. You know, people died, moved on because of various reasons, and the whole village was kind of forgotten about. But what strikes me straight away is that the, the high density, the high density nature of the living like you had houses literally right beside each other. Um, so what's special about um, rural living? So some of the things are quite easy to kind of articulate around fresh air, you know, lack of, uh, lack of traffic, beautiful countryside, interior kind of friendlier kind of environments. This fallacy about it being cheap, let me tell you, it's not cheaper to live in the kind of countryside. Those are the easy ones, but the real valuable part is the sense of community. And this sense of community has multiple interactions. So if you live in a rural environment, you're going to be part of the community. It's almost unavoidable. And this transcends a lot of barriers. So it's not unusual to see a 65-year-old go out for a drink with a 25-year-old. Perhaps through scarcity, but I presume more through kind of respect of, of kind of elders. And this kind of cascades all the way through that kind of makes rural living quite different to kind of living, living in the city.
yeah, sorry, there was one, one point I meant to make there as well. The, this um, living in the rural society, what I found different from the city was that everyone knows everything about everything. And this game manifests itself to me one day when I got a card addressed to me as Owen Kennedy, Kong, Dublin 14. Now, it's not even right. Dublin is here and Mayo is over the other side of the country. So even with it, the wrong kind of county address, it still managed to make its way to me. So people understand and know everything about each other. But what's different is, because you're running into the same people again, people generally make up if they have fights, if problems kind of happen, they generally kind of sort them out, mainly because you're going to run into the same people again and again. In the city, you can have even more interactions, but you can be a stranger in the place you live. That then generally doesn't kind of happen in the countryside. People have pride in something more than just their physical house. They have pride in the kind of environment of where they kind of live. Um, and this kind of keeping tradition alive is quite, is quite important. So when I, started, um, when I started doing this presentation, uh, it was mainly, this, this was the main slide. This was what it was going to be all about. And when I started writing it, I suddenly worked out I was starting to sound like a Vodafone ad. Like it was describing kind of this great um, panacea for all ills that technology could deliver. And there's no doubt it makes a huge difference. That photograph at the top, that's what I look at from my office. But up to about a month ago, in order to send anything beyond an email, I'd travel to Galway, which was like an hour away. Crazy stuff just to kind of get access. Where now, like, I can fundamentally have the same working experience and probably enhanced working experience as anyone in the room. You know, from file sharing to video conferencing to rapid kind of research to uploading and downloading massive files. I can do that all, all that instantly. And that's pretty predictable stuff. Predictable as well is around the experience that my children have. So in education, you know, everything from them dialing in classrooms in France and Spain to kind of have collaborative kind of sessions, all the way through to using uh, virtual reality to visit museums that are in other parts of the country that they can't get to, all the way through to augmented reality, kind of showing them and helping them interpret their kind of local environments. But the stuff that interests me more is this stuff, which is the living stuff, and how it can be transformative. So take, for example, my father or my um, uncle-in-law who lives down the road from us, a classic West of Ireland kind of bachelor. If mobility comes in an issue for him, independent living is probably gone. It's probably unsustainable. It's probably unworkable. But if you think about how technology could absolutely revolutionise that, so um, his hospital appointments does it remotely. You know, smart sensors in the house already kind of tell the doctor what his sugar levels are like, what his blood levels are like, predict the algorithms start to predict what he should be doing, not doing. Home automation means we could tell where he is and if his behavior is slightly different, if he's fallen down, it can turn on and off lights that he might kind of forget to do so he doesn't touch them when he's going up the stairs. Um, driverless cars automatically solves that whole dilemma around people and drunk driving and the death of rural pubs or even just getting out when he can't kind of drive anymore. Uh, cameras and linked with data, linked with communications make his house living very safe crime would kind of plummet you know there would be it would be very he would be connected to earlier or early warning kind of system so it'd be quite a safe environment for it to kind of live in and the list kind of goes on like it completely could completely revolutionize that kind of living for for that kind of generation but as usual with um with any of these it's not so simple so you know when you look at this you start peeling back the layers of the onion and lots of kind of issues kind of fall up so first is, is it actually that bad? Is this rural decay that we kind of talk about that you see lots of countless articles on that really kind of focus on broadband? Is it really that bad? And what I mean by that is a lot of the counters that people have are shops. So the number of shops that close, they use that as a counter. And there's loads of surveys about this in terms of the towns with the most shut down uh, premises. But that doesn't take account of the amount of people like me who work remotely who work in the local villages, um, who are largely invisible. They never come in and they're largely kind of visible because the premises and stuff aren't, aren't kind of there. This stuff has been constantly changing. It's not new. Like, you know, this revolutionising of technology and how it's revolutionising the countryside is something that's kind of constant. We need to be really careful how we release technology into the wild, though. On one side, we risk creating kind of, you know, a zombie children similar to what you'd have in the city where they forget what it's like to go out and fall off trees and twist ankles and have a home sort of existence. All the way through to the other problem where you release massive amount of broadband without services and ends up pointless. Ends up like the very early Tesco computer for schools system where they sat in the principal's office and never got used or the lessons from early electrification and what that does. And lastly, it actually does the government care. So there's always been a mistrust between government and rural society, and for some very good reasons. They're hard to govern. 
in general, always have been. And it's really costly. So when you look at the massive delays on the national broadband rollout, it's basically down to kind of cost. If you took an economic argument to this, you would, you would close down country living. You would close down. Distances are too great. It doesn't make sense economically. And sometimes you have to question whether leadership's actually there to kind of improve uh, community and to introduce uh, technology. So what matters and how do you kind of deal with what you actually do? So the principal thing that uh, from all the conversations that I've had with people about this and people who are much more knowledgeable than me is not to start with the individual. In rolling out technology in order for it to have an impact, you need to kind of start with the community. And there's lots of really interesting initiatives that are taking place now who are going that direction. So take the Ludgate hub then, Skibbereen. Skibbereen, small village, really big town, or small town in Kerry. And they've put in a very multi-million euro hub. And it's basically an innovation centre where people can come in and out and, and work. And these hub structures really work. Like, I'm always dismayed when I'm in Dublin to be connected to a contractor only to find out that they live quite close to where I came from. This feeding into the city, like the city has to be where everything kind of gets redirected. Where these hubs in, in, uh, create that level of collaboration and really enhance that kind of... Um, a uh, circular kind of economy that, that doesn't happen necessarily by itself. ETANS is another interesting one, which what ETANS does is it takes a huge amount of data, collates all the data and case studies on what's actually happening in all these towns, visualizes and collates it into format, then creates kind of an online kind of um, process so that people can start plugging into the community rather than just deploying kind of technology. And then finally, they've really smart kind of communications and collaboration <coughs> layers, technology layers. So it's plugging into what really matters, understanding what drives community rather than the focus being on like how do we get extra kind of broadband implemented. And finally, you don't necessarily need to invest in huge hubs, costly hubs, um, or you don't need to invest in heavy duty technology to get people collaborating, kind of working together around technology. Um, I run a festival in the west of Ireland, and what we do is we use the existing infrastructure. So we use the pubs, the books, the coffee shops, the gift stores, and we use those presentation venues. So we don't do a big venue like this. We put people in small kind of hubs and get them working together. So a huge amount can be done, but it's that focusing on the community part rather than focusing on the technology part. So what I learned when I was kind of going through technology inevitable, it's going to happen. It will be disruptive, hopefully disruptive for the right, for the right ways and not for the, right, the wrong ways. Um, it's not new. Um, aggregating, when it comes to content, aggregating rather than fighting, the, fighting Facebook and building your own kind of kingdom seems to be the way forward. But fundamentally, the last line I'd like to leave you with is my fear is that technology will give people the ability to live in the countryside but not to participate in rural living. And they're two very different things. Thanks very much for your time. As I said, I'm the warm-up for Joan. If you want to find out more about a congregation, there's some of the links and some of the place I live, and this presentation will be up there later on. Thank you very much. OK. Hi. I wish he hadn't said that, to be honest. This is his gig, and he needed a real farmer to actually come along and uh, be the other part of his rural Ireland. So uh, I'm Joan Mulvihill. I'm the Centre Director for IC4, which is the Irish Centre for Cloud Computing and Commerce in DCU. And I'm not going to talk to you about computing or DCU. I am a farmer's daughter from Longford. Is anyone else here from the countryside? Anyone else here grew up on a farm? Yay, so you know what I'm talking about. Two and a half thousand turnips a day. And that's how you end up with osteoarthritis in your right shoulder. So anyway, um, Owen asked me to come along and, uh, and talk to you about my experience, I suppose, really, of technology in a rural community. Now, I am a really, really contrary person. I am so contrary that when I left London and I moved back to Ireland, to Dublin, I lived in Dublin for 13 years in the countryside. I lived out in Rathmichael, up a windy little country road. Uh, you had to walk 20 minutes to get near a bus. You had to drive to buy milk. I literally lived in a rural community in Dublin. So naturally, I decided, when I decided to move down the country, I would move to the town. So all the years living in Dublin, I lived in the countryside, and now I live back down the country in Mullingar, and I live at the edge of the town. Um, so I suppose contrary in that sense is I, I've always got a foot in each camp. Uh, and for the last 13 years of my career, well, nine years of my career, I've had this foot in my technology camp. And, uh, and Owen asked about how you weave it into rural society. Well, I have found out how my mother has woven it into the farm in Ballymahon. 
I asked, I was talking to my dad one day and he said something about the Mart prices. Now, when you're a kid and the Mart prices come on the news, you get shh. And we all have to sit there as he diligently writes down the Mart prices for a pen or the factory prices for cattle. And you're going shh. So now, apparently, we don't have to shh anymore because my mum... Your mother's printing it off for me. Now, I think my dad thinks there's a fax machine in another room because that's where his technology advancement stopped and that my mother is getting the Mart prices faxed. Now, my mother is in the other room on her computer looking up the Mart prices, downloading for them, th them for him and printing them off and he brings them in. So that is how email works in our house. Mom prints it off and carries it into him. So it's kind of semi-snail mail. Um, and that's how, you're, how they're weaving it in for older generations. It's really by stealth, either through their spouses or their children. Um, and I think that's important. Like, we're at a, a changing generation now. My dad's, my parents are probably the last of that generation who have not had technology become part of their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so I don't think it's going to be as much of a challenge in the future. So what I'm thinking about is uh, when, when Owen asked me to think about this and what I would talk about, I started, it was around the time I was reading all this stuff about the Japanese knotweed. Now, who knows what Japanese knotweed is? Yes. Does it scare the crap out of you? It terrifies me. I bought this house in Mullingar and I'm constantly checking that is rhubarb. That is definitely rhubarb. It's not Japanese knotweed and it's the other end of the garden so we should be okay. For those of you who don't know what Japanese knotweed is, Japanese knotweed, and I sound like quite the horticulturalist when I say this, is a non-invasive, no, is an invasive non-native species. I can never say it all long ago. So it's a non-native invasive species of plant. And it was brought to Ireland and in the UK as well uh, as an ornamental plant to put in your garden. And what they didn't realise is that the roots grow 10 times faster than the surface. And what it does is it gets underneath the fabric on the foundations of houses and roads and infrastructure and destroys them. And I thought, is that an analogy for rural broadband. Is rural broadband Japanese knotweed that we are going to roll out as, let's be honest, a non-native, tick, invasive, tick species? And what is it going to do to the fabric of our society, to the foundations of our society, and how we interact with one another? Um, so, Owen obviously now knows this living in Kong. I knew this all my life living in Ballymahan, a town of one street. Rural communities, probably why I'm so contrary, are contrary. They are full of contradictions. You walk down the street and everybody knows you, everybody knows your name, and what's more important, they know exactly who you are. And who you are in a rural community in Ireland goes back four generations. And if you cannot trace your roots back four generations, you're a blow-in. You're just some new person. You're just some randomer like, oh, and you're a blow-in, and, and your children will be blow-ins. And, and you're just about hanging in there. They let you in because your wife is from that neck of the woods. But anyway, I, I'm a blow-in in Mullingar, and I grew up a half an hour away. But anyway, uh, yeah, they're intensely, every, intensely public places. Everybody knows everybody else's business, which is fascinating given that I've never met a more intensely private group of people. Everybody, your mother will always bring you up to, oh, don't be telling people your business. My mother would be horrified that I've even said the word my mother or my father. If, I, she, if she knew I had discussed them in any way in public, she'd have a total meltdown. So in rural communities, we tend to be very, very private. We're told, don't tell everyone your business. And yet, how is it that everybody knows everybody else's business? So it's this kind of public, private, constant tension that we're living with all the time. And I wonder how social media is going to impact that in terms of how we communicate with one another. So yes, you live in a city for anonymity to be surrounded by people. And then you go down the country because you think it's going to be all idyllic and you'll be, have this lovely, private, quiet time. It's, it's, it's the most invasive time ever. You know, your neighbor, people call to your house on the off chance that you're there. I had to move to Mullingar. It's half an hour away from my parents. So my mother would have to phone me in advance so we couldn't have a drive-by shooting of her just randomly arriving. And, and I've got five minutes left. Ten minutes left. Ten seconds. Ten minutes. Crikey, I should slow down. I should really slow down because I don't have an awful lot more to say. Um, but I did, I did want to talk about that, that idea that it's totally different in this public-private thing. Now, the other comment I wanted to make in relation to all of that is how social media impacts the sense of privacy and public profile of ourselves. I was speaking at Electric Picnic last weekend, 
on how to be well in a sick sea, how to protect our mental health in a time where technology is impacting it. And it, it got me thinking about how we are in communities and how we lived in society um, in terms of our friends and our confidence. And one of the things that struck me is that with so much technology, with so much news, it's very easy to feel very, very small. And it's very easy to feel very, very powerless because you realize just how tiny and ineffective we are as individuals when there's so much going on in the world. And yet when you grow up in a small town and the limits of your world news are the edge of that town, you're very sure of who you are in that place. You know, you have agency, you have a certain amount of influence, you have, there's confidence in that, there's something rooted in that, that gives you strength. So when I was 17, up to the age of 17, you know, I live in a small town and you're growing up and you're living your life. And you feel, you know, these are my friends and this is the sphere of my world. And then you get older and, and I end up being the captain of the debate team and I started thinking about whole world issues. That's the first time I ever got really upset because I felt so powerless and then you know as we go through time now we've got more and more information bombarding us all the time so we're feeling more and more and more powerless so I wonder then you know how that is going to impact our sense of selves and that fabric of society and how we interact with one another and I think you know what in a small town you have that sense of agency that sense of association and the social media is going to you know, you've got your friends, you don't need to talk to them on Facebook when you're talking to them face to face. And, it, and it's not, I don't think it's going to have a huge fundamental change for, for the majority. But the people I think about, and I was thinking about this in the last couple of days, and it's not the older people I think, you know, they'll just step away the parts that they don't want to use and their children will bring it in by stealth via the dining room or their connected homes. But the people I think will be most impacted by technology and high quality broadband, not Japanese, not weed style, but in a very, very positive way, are the people who are in the margins. The margins of rural communities. Because it is really easy to exist in a rural town in Ireland when you play football, when you're on the local camogie team or hurling team or you know, whatever guy team you're playing for, or whether it's soccer or athletics, if you're in the mainstream, in a rural community in Ireland, you're set, you're fine. And you'll use your social media. And I'm not saying your life is going to be easier. You're going to have all the same travails as, as any other teenager. But I think the real value of technology in rural communities is for people on the margins, people who don't have a tribe. Because I'll tell you, I'm going to my school reunion tomorrow night. And... Uh, I wasn't a mainstream kid. I wasn't really nerdy. Well, a little bit nerdy. I had bad braces, and I didn't feel hugely connected to everyone else who all play. I mean, if you weren't, didn't play basketball in my school, you were nothing. And at five foot nine, you'd think I'd have played more. Um, but you know, if you weren't in the mainstream in a school in a rural Ireland, you could feel very, very marginalised. And I think social media gives people an opportunity to connect with a tribe that is not available to them in a smaller area. And I think that's where the real value is going to be, to people who are feeling isolated, who might feel more marginalized. And I think really in the end, technology will support businesses. And you're right, we, there are pictures, uh, two, the two shops I grew up with in my town have both closed in the last year. Others have opened, that there's stories, they don't all close for the same reason, but you know, you do see stuff of like that and a, a part of you is heartbroken and a little bit sad that some of those structures are gone, but other things replace them. You know, we've got Centre Parks coming to Ballymahan now, the biggest tourist investment. I said, I moved to the Midlands and look what came. That's just total coincidence. Um, other things will replace them and things will evolve and they will continue. But um, I do think it's the real opportunity is for, for when things aren't easy, for, when, for, for people who are more on the fringes and to give them a capacity to be connected and to live better, richer lives. Now, you will wonder why I'm carrying my phone around. It's just after beeping. I don't, Colin works with me. We're doing the step challenge at work and there's two teams in IC4. I'm on one of them and, uh, and I really don't want to waste any steps. So if I'm going to be standing here walking around, I wanted to have my phone in my hand 
list, because I did say there's a forfeit for the weakest link in our team, and I reckon that'll possibly be me. Although now I live in rural Ireland, it's 3.3 kilometres of walking to mow my lawn. Um, so anyway, look, at, that's all I wanted to say about it. Technology is a wonderful, wonderful thing. It, there, are, there are Japanese knotweed uh, analogies to be drawn, but as I say, I think the benefits longer term will far outweigh the costs. But the one thing I would say is from, from a policy point of view, at a public sector level, we're, we're putting more attention on broadband than we are on water. And we consider both of those now to be human rights. We're prepared to pay for broadband, we're not prepared to pay for water. All of these things are infrastructure, and I, and I wonder to myself where we've gone as a society when we put broadband ahead of water. Thank you. Is that all right? Well, thanks very much for that, um, Joan and Owen. Um, I've, I've I actually recognise you now, Joan, um, from Mullingar. I've seen you walking around because I live in Mullingar as well. Do you? <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> Whereabouts do you live? Uh, uh, not on camera. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, broadly. But, uh, <laughs> but no, yeah. I was, the more you were talking, I was like, I'm sure I've seen you in town. <laughs> Um, anyway, so thank you very much for that. Um, one thing I do like about social media in rural towns is it reduces isolation. Um, I was a stay-at-home mum for a long time and I moved into a new area and I was so grateful that I had the opportunity to go onto Facebook groups or to the HSC website and, and find toddler groups and clubs and activities that would take me out of my home and out of myself, you know, out of my own head. When you're a new mum, it's, it's hard. So social media does have its place, but for the same, for the same reason, you can't escape it. And that's why issues like children with Ask FM and, you know, the torment and the, the abuse that they get, it really is down to perception and where you're at at the time, um, I think. But, you know, great illustrations there of how to use technology for both of you. And, uh, yeah, thank you very much for that. So that is the end of our talk for now. Oh, well, we've got a question. My apologies. Um, I, I'll just uh, go and get the question for you. I'd question the idea of IT helping rural communities. I think we should be looking more at how do rural communities help IT. My background is farming, I'm County Cork. And if you want development, the cities traditionally provided that development because they had the diversity. The cities have now become intolerant and diversity absolutely needs tolerance. In, the, in rural communities and in any community, you will find tolerance because in my situation, if the cows break out, my neighbor might be an asshole, <coughs> but I tolerate him because when that happens, <coughs> I want the cows caught and vice versa. So we are setting up you remember when the IT started, the whole internet started, it was going to do wonderful things. Instead of providing diversity, it provided platforms for monocultures of intolerance, both, on, both virtuous and otherwise. So within rural areas, rural communities, or any communities, I think <coughs> the IT we should be looking at IT. How do you articulate the ability to tolerate and get IT to do that? And then you use the example of the knotweed as a metaphor. Maybe we should be looking at sourdough. You can keep sourdough in very small quantities, but if you can do it right, you can produce really good bread in large quantity. We should see these communities as the small sourdough. Learn from that. Why, why is that growing well? So that you can expand it. Thank you. So, Thank you very much, Connor. So just, just as a reply to it, you're right in that um, 
there's there's a few things kind of going on in that like technology is, is a bit of a juggernaut and you know the exit of young people from rural society is another juggernaut so there are two things that are really really kind of hard to kind of change but you're correct in that like if it's if if it's just released into the wild and technology in silicon valley is allowed to do what it does and just implement it across rural society it'll kill it it won't learn it won't it will adopt very poorly and it'll just create that banal banality that you kind of see in a, in urban settings, I suppose. You know, that richness of it will kind of disappear. And there's a lot that communities can kind of bring to the internet. Um, and you, you've just uh, outlined a few of them. So for me, the, the whole approach is if it's, if it's a focus on technology and, you know, the broadband speeds and, you know, the rolling out without services, it's, it's a mistaken kind of approach. Or even the rolling out of, of hardware, like that's a mistaken kind of approach. Where if it connects into deeply and understands what drives rural communities, what makes them kind of special, and then enhances them uh, and brings them along, and then technology parts at the end, but then it can actually, it can really enhance it. It can work, but otherwise, if it's a let, just it, it becomes Japanese, not weed. Otherwise, I think uh, I, I like what you said about, uh, about platforms. You know, one of the things that always struck me, and I remember when the Stop Sopa campaign, the legislation was all kicking off, and there was drama. And I remember thinking, you know, if someone sprays graffiti on your wall, who's responsible for cleaning it up? The person who owns the wall, or the person who put it there? Well. You can't identify who put it there, so the owner of the wall maybe takes a responsibility. So we have these platforms, and some take responsibility and have put in measures to remove the nasty, and others just go, you know what, we'll throw some lip service at that, pretend we really care and we really, really don't. But fundamentally, it comes down to human behavior and who's putting the graffiti up there. Some people do wonderful and beautiful graffiti in the way of Banksy, and it's art, and you would want to preserve it. And others do vile, nasty, horrible things, and they put that up there. And I think one of the biggest challenges we all face as a society is that legislation is so far behind where the technology has gone. And, and it is all designed around old rules and, and old paradigms for how society works, what is an infringement on someone else's rights, what is damaging or hurtful to somebody else, and our ability to fight back and deal with that. So I think there are some of the big challenges, and, and I totally get the whole someone's cattle getting out and having to chase after that, and, and that idea that your neighbour might be a dickhead, but at least he'll send them back. Um, so, you know, I think that kind of community spirit, we did an ag tech event in DCU in July, and it was absolutely brilliant to see the wonderful things and innovations we can come up with in technology to support farming communities and the, the, pr the production and tracking and tracing of highest standards of food. And, and, you know, we looked at things like heat mapping of disease outbreaks so that you wouldn't have things like foot and mouth, which was just tragic to watch, where technology could have moved in faster to track outbreaks of things like that. So there's wonderful things that can be done, but you're absolutely right. It's about balancing that with what's good for people. Okay, thank you very much, both of you, for answering Connor's question there. Okay, um, are there any other questions? Okay, thank you very much again, and uh, thank you for your presentation today. Um, we're going to be finishing the session now, so thank you very much for your time, and we'll be on to the next presenter shortly. Oh,